Uh, thank you all for attending. My name is Chris Cruz, and I'm the worldwide leader for AWS Marketplace infrastructure, big data, and DevOps categories. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a little bit about networking solutions that are available through AWS Marketplace, some of the better use cases that we see customers adopt. And then I'm going to transition over to uh, Varun Gupta, who's joining me from Salesforce. And he's going to talk a little bit about how uh, Salesforce uses Marketplace to find networking solutions and some of the things they've done to establish their network within the cloud. So just to kind of set the context, you know, when we look at customers and how they journey to AWS, um, they really all have you know, three common goals in mind. So first of all, they're looking for agility, right? So cloud gives them that ability to spin things up very quickly and move very fast and take advantage of market opportunities. So we see that as a common goal across all of our customers as they use the cloud. Uh, second, they want to take advantage of the flexibility. So they want to be able to scale up as well as scale down. So if you're a retailer, as an example, and you've got peak seasons, you want to have maximum compute during that peak season, but then not have to pay for it the rest of the year. So you want to have that flexibility to go both ways. And finally, you want to have the freedom to innovate. Right? One of the biggest inhibitors to uh, innovation pre-cloud days was the fact that you had to buy all this equipment just to try something out. So there's this massive capital investment that would occur just to try something. And cloud is great because now you can try something out instantly, you can scale it up very fast and scale it very down, and you're not inhibited by that you know, large upfront cost. Now, as people move to the cloud, we see them move at you know, varying paces and speeds. Some people move very fast and some people move very slow. But what we see is they go through four separate distinct phases. And again, some people go through these phases very fast and some people move very slow. But the first phase is that discovery and test phase. And so what we see at this phase is this is where really people just try to get their foot in the water. They try out the cloud. You know, and this is where they're going to do things like DevOps. They might try a new application workload. And this is really just to prove out that value proposition to the cloud and, and get some experience and then really justify starting to move forward with separate projects. So once we see customers move from there, they move into what we call kind of application-based projects. And so this is where they might start to take their e-commerce stack, maybe their websites. Um, oftentimes, we actually see analytics really start to pop up here just because it's so cheap to store data in the cloud and it's very cheap to do uh, you know, a massive query and scale that back down as needed. And so you see a lot of these application-based projects move uh, up into the cloud. Uh, once they see success there, what we see is they start to go towards a cloud-first type of approach where they, start to, they really start to standardize. And when they get to this phase, this is when they start to actually decommission you know, one of their data centers. So oftentimes, a large enterprise might have a fleet of data centers. Let's say they have four data centers. At this phase, we actually see them start to shut down one of those four and have it all up in the cloud. And so when you get to this phase, you know, having a hybrid architecture really becomes critical. right? Also, um, having solutions that can support you know, highly available applications also become critical because now you're starting to, to move your back office into the cloud. And so now you're not dealing with just maybe your websites, but you're talking about general ledger, CRM, and those types of solutions. And then finally, they get to that business transformation phase, which is where they've moved everything up to the cloud. And now they can really take advantage and maximize those goals on the right. So they can have maximum agility, they have uh, all kinds of flexibility, and they can really innovate faster than ever before. And so why I kind of go through these four phases up front here is you can kind of see the current state in the box. That's kind of where a lot of our customers are today. A lot of people have already gone well past phase one, and they're in phase two and phase three. And you know, when you're in these phases, what happens is your networking and your security are foundational to whatever you do, right? And candidly, it goes all the way over to the phase one, but you need to have solutions that allow you to establish these hybrid networks that allow you to scale your, up, your applications up and down as needed. And so that's where Marketplace really becomes a critical part of how people adopt the cloud because we provide all kinds of value-added solutions from third-party vendors so that you can actually make this transition. And it really allows you to establish that uh, AWS infrastructure and having that hybrid architecture. So that's where AWS Marketplace comes in the mix. So our charter is really to work with the third-party ISVs to help them get their solutions available so that AWS customers can use them in the same consumable format that they're buying all their other AWS services. So if you think, uh, just take a step back for a second, they're buying things like EC2 and S3, and they're used to buying it in a consumption model. And that's really our charge, to go work with third-party ISVs to help them get their software so you can deploy that software on demand. 
Uh, the catalog is fully curated, and what we mean by curated is we actually turn on every single product, we go through all the documentation, we validate that that product is gonna work as advertised, and there's nothing wrong with that product before we ever actually post that to the website. And we do that for not only the third-party software, but we also do that for all the open source products that you'll see in the Marketplace catalog, right? So we've really established over the five years that we've been in business, uh, a really a strong trusted relationship with that AWS customer. They know that they might be able to get something like Lampstack from a variety of places, but if they launch it from Marketplace, they know that it's gonna have a trusted experience, it's gonna work as advertised, there's not gonna be malware in there and anything else that might be causing problems. Uh, the catalog has grown dramatically in the last five years. We now have over 1,280 ISVs selling solutions through AWS Marketplace. We have over 4,200 listings in AWS Marketplace. This month alone, we launched 35 brand new ISVs into Marketplace and about 150 new titles. So the catalog is growing uh, by the week and by the month. And you know, one of the reasons why is we really provide a simplified procurement and deployment. So when an AWS customer buys something out of AWS Marketplace, we track that consumption, we tell them how much they use for that monthly period, and then we provide that back to them uh, in the same manner that they get their bill for all their other AWS services. So it's kind of a consolidated billing tool. Uh, and so customers love the fact that they get all the third-party products presented to them along with their AWS services. Uh, we also take the catalog and we replicate this catalog across the globe. So if you're looking for a way to get software, not only maybe at your corporate office, but if you're spinning up international offices, Marketplace is an excellent solution because we literally take this entire catalog and we populate it across the globe. So this is a benefit for both the customers as well as the ISVs. You know, a lot of times if an ISV didn't have something like Marketplace, they'd have to figure out a way to actually spin up these instances all over the, over the globe. So we've really simplified that international rollout perspective. And we continue to add customers to Marketplace. We now have 160,000 active customers, and that's on a monthly basis. So we've, we're seeing really good customer adoption uh, through AWS Marketplace. Now, this slide kind of shows some of the more popular titles that are available through AWS Marketplace. You can see you know, a lot of uh, market-leading names here. So operating systems are obviously very popular. Security is one of our stronger categories just because AWS has a shared security model. And so the customer is responsible for that security for the application on up. And so a lot of the security ISVs do very well. Storage is a big category just because we've got a lot of great AWS services uh, for storage. And so these solutions really complement those solutions. Um, data, big data, those types of solutions do very well in AWS just because we kind of go back to that, those four phases, that second phase, analytical workloads really become one of those first applications that come across. And of course, DevOps, and you can see some of the DevOps providers like Chef and Puppet and so on, those guys always do very good through Marketplace just because one of those first applications that come across is typically those DevOps workloads. And then finally, um, oops, going our way there. Finally, uh, the category that we're gonna talk about today is networking. And so networking's in the middle and you can see a lot of the bellwethers there. So companies like Cisco, which is a known entity, um, as well as F5 Network, so leader in application delivery. You can also see some of the born in the cloud providers uh, in this column, so companies like Nginx that have de designed their solutions from the ground up to work for AWS. So when you dive into the networking category, you know, why do people use networking solutions from AWS? Uh, marketplace, it, you know, there's a lot of words on this slide, but what it really boils down to is they want to expand and they want to integrate their existing networks. A lot of these organizations already have established networks, and so they're looking for ways to, how do you expand that, how do you integrate that up to AWS, and how do you do that as easy as possible? And so that's really our charter when we look at the networking categories, how do we make it easier for our customers to establish these networks as they start to expand to the cloud? Right? And so they want to you know, combine their AWS and their on-prem investments, but they still want to have that enterprise-grade control, visibility, and policy, and consistency. And that's where a lot of these third-party products really come in and really help supplement that AWS experience. And they want to continue to use many of those same tools that they've been using on-prem, but they don't want to have to uh, you know, change that pricing model. Right? A lot of times, organizations will have a big investment for those on-prem technologies. So if you take a look at the last slide with F5, a lot of times they've got customers that have built up skill sets for things like iRules. And the last thing they want to do is have to retrain all their network engineers on how to use a new scripting language. Instead, they want to leverage that investment, but now just do that transition to the cloud. So what do we hear from our customers? 
you know, so, you know, here's some of the common things that we get asked when we talk to customers about what do they want to see from a networking perspective from AWS Marketplace. First of all, consistency with that on-premise technology, right? They don't want to have one load balancer on-prem and a different load balancer up in the cloud. They'd like to have a consistent experience. They want to connect those data centers in branch locations. Right? So a lot of organizations have lots of different lo locations and they need to integrate that and tie those networks together. So how do they do that? They want to simplify the network management. So once you've established uh, a virtual private cloud, typically what organizations do is they start to add more and more virtual private clouds. So once you have more than two, you need to network those. And how do you do that? You know, and how do you handle the routing and all the traffic that goes between those virtual private clouds, but do that in an elegant manner? How do you just connect to a, a, you know, a VPC and remote network? So this could be something as basic as just a VPN. And how do you tie in a VPN solution that's going to work with AWS to your existing, uh, your existing environment? And then finally, how do you establish application control above what some of the AWS services do today? So if you think of things like application load balancer from AWS or network load balancer, they provide a lot of great functionality. And oftentimes organizations look for tools from marketplace to also sit on top of that and expand that out to different use cases. Again, things like iRolls from F5, they might need UDP to support. And so they're looking for third party tools to complement that experience. So what are those common networking scenarios that these all boil down to? And who are the ISVs that really start to fit into some of these areas, right? So when you optimize branch connectivity, this is where organizations like Cisco, Riverbed has some great solutions here, or you'll see born in the cloud providers like an Aviatrix. When they want to connect their VPCs to remote networks, again, Cisco, a player here. But we've seen a lot of good success with a lot of these born in the cloud ISVs. So companies like NetGate and OpenVPN have been very popular solutions out of AWS Marketplace. How do you do HA across multiple VPCs? Well, again, that's where Cisco or Juniper, Juniper kind of takes a different approach. They put this into their uh, next-gen firewall, but they've got some solutions here, or Nginx. And finally, for application delivery in, you know, over a hybrid cloud environment, this is where solutions like F5 have done very good. Pulse Secure is a relatively new company. They bought the assets from Brocade, if you know who Brocade is, for their virtual traffic routers. So let's take a look at, at a closer look at some of these use cases. So the first one is, you know, how do you do that branch connectivity to applications hosted on AWS? And so you can see the diagram here on the left. You know, you've got a customer, they've got a VPC, and then they've got a gateway that connects back to their branch office as well as a corporate office. And so you'll see a lot of great use cases here. So again, simple VPC, you know, a VPN solution like a NetGate or OpenVPN can, you know, get you quickly integrated into that environment. We also see. Um, uh, you know, companies like Silver Peak do very well here for like WAN acceleration, right? So we need to have great performance across this type of network, right? Also, Cisco has done a really good job. They actually purchased a company called Meraki uh, not too long ago, and it's almost like branch connectivity in a box. And so they've done very good when you start to provide a WAN solution across the internet. Another primary use case that we see that's a, a popular use case is how do you simplify that workload migration, right? Because a lot of times it's very hard to just say, we're just going to do a student body left, take everything that we might have had in an existing data center and drop that onto AWS. Typically there's a migration over time. And so you need to have tools that can handle those hybrid scenarios, right? And so that's where we see uh, ADCs do very well. And see so again, you can see the use case here on the left you know, where you might have an AWS environment and you have an on-prem environment. And how do you balance an application across that? That's a very complex task. And that's where, again, we see a lot of people turn to Marketplace to find solutions that do that. So they can get that secure application traffic, they can manage that performance, and they can maintain that visibility. And so again, this is where we see solutions like F5 do very well. Citrix plays in this space if you're like a, a Zen desktop type of customer. And then again, Pulse Secure with their virtual traffic manager, which is something they acquired from Brocade, you know, fit very well into this pit, uh, position. Another popular use case is the transit VPC, right? Which is, you know, a more simpler way to look at this is really just a hub and spoke architecture. So again, when customers establish their environments on AWS, they establish virtual private clouds or VPCs. Once you have more than two VPCs, you have to figure out how do you tie those together? And at a high level, there's really two popular ways to do this. There's this you know, transit VPC, which is a hub and spoke model, and then mesh, which we'll talk about here in a second. But a hub and spoke model, as you can see, is taking multiple VPCs that are on the, uh, the left side here, 
and having that kind of hub in the middle to really handle all that traffic and routing, right? And this allows customers to control and you know, you know, manage those distributed uh, VPCs. It simplifies that complex network management and it's helping reduce costs because you're now consolidating everything into that hub model. And so for this type of architecture, we see players like Cisco and their clouds, uh, their CSR product do very well here. Nginx Plus does well here. And then Juniper also has a solution that's very good from a kind of a transit VPC perspective. Alternatively, one of the other popular uh, networking scenarios is a mesh network. So this is kind of an any-to-any -any connectivity type of uh, approach, right? And so you've got your corporate data center, and then you're just feeding out everything in unison from that corporate data center, right? So it's a little bit of a different approach to doing networking here. Um, and again, you know, same kind of drivers. You want to control diverse and uh, distributed VPCs. You're trying to you know, really you know, control your performance and your latency and you want to reduce the costs. And so we've seen this is also a really popular use case out of Marketplace. And this is where companies like Riverbed and their Steel Connect franchise do very well. Um, Aviatrix, which is more of a born in the cloud provider, they've done a very good job here as well. So let's go through a couple of customer examples. Um, so Simple Pay, so Simple Pay is a payment processing company out of Sydney, Australia. And you know, they were trying to figure out how to expand globally, right? And so they turned to AWS Marketplace you know, to look at solutions there. And what they found, and they ended up going with Riverbed uh, Steel Connect, but they were able to actually reduce their provisioning time by 90%. So if you just take a step back and think about how would you do a global rollout uh, pre-cloud days, you know, you're shipping hardware across the globe and there's all kinds of logistical issues that go away now that you start to do this with AWS and Marketplace. And so you can see they reduced their provisioning time by 90%. Um, and you can see the quote from their CTO, sitting at my desk, I can turn on AWS in a new country, and in 10 minutes, the network is connected. And that's a very powerful statement when you really think about it. Just if you try to rewind from you know, today to maybe five or even 10 years ago, next to impossible to do something like that. Another good example is Gree. So Gree is actually a gaming company. And the challenge that they have is they're you know, constantly kicking out new games, but they're also acquiring a lot of games. And so when you acquire new companies, you acquire new networks. And so how do you tie those networks together is a big challenge, right? And so what they were looking for was kind of a cloud-centric model to really handle new game launches as well as these acquisitions, right? And so what they did is they, they turned to Marketplace, they ended up selecting Aviatrix, and the feedback that they gave is that they, re, you know, they simplified the migration to their VPC with 50% of the less people than they took before and it reduced the time to integrate new game companies that they acquired by upwards of 95%, right? So it's very strong uh, ROI there. You can see the quote from the director of DevOps, you know, where they used AWS and Aviatrix to significantly lower game development and integration time. So another really good example of uh, another company using AWS and Marketplace to find a networking solution to support what they were trying to do from an acquisition perspective. So I'm gonna walk you really th quickly through um, what the experience looks like if you're trying to find a networking solution through AWS Marketplace. This is the website. You guys can all pull this up on your phones today. You can put it up on your laptops. We provide all the products in Marketplace, not only through the website itself, but directly through the EC2 console. So we're the only way if you wanna have a product displayed through the EC2 console, it's through Marketplace. So we make the products available there as well as through the website. So you can see this is the, the, the public website. Um, and so let's say I want to browse for a category. So I'm going to click in the upper left-hand corner. I'm going to click on View Categories. And what you'll be presented with is a, is a menu here of 37 popular categories that we've seen people use out of AWS Marketplace. And so there's a whole bunch of uh, you know, uh, you know, typical names up there. And what we're going to do, obviously, we're going to drill into uh, network uh, infrastructure. So when you click on this link, what happens is it brings you to a new menu. And you can see, okay, well, there's 357 products that popped up that are registered as network infrastructure products. And then you've got a whole bunch of different filters on the left that you can start to really start to get a granular view of what you're trying to find, right? You can select different operating systems, different pricing plans, different locations, and different features that they've adopted, things like Product Support Connect, which provides you know, integrated support back to the ISV. So in this case, let's say uh, you know, you're a CentOS shop and you want to say, you know what, I want to find products that are built on CentOS because that's my approved OS. So I'm going to click on the Linux uh, you know, Twisty and I select CentOS. I'm going to select an annual listing. And, um, and then here's a couple options that I get presented with. So here's F5 solution as well as lowbalancer.org. 
So we're going to take a look at the first solution, which is F5. And you get presented with the seller page. And so this page provides a whole bunch of additional metadata about this individual product, right? So you can get the description up top. You can see customer ratings, you know, the version that's available. You can select previous versions. Perhaps you're using an older version. You haven't updated to the most recent version. You can go and get that previous version, you know, what that operating system is, what that delivery method is. So we make products available through Marketplace in an Amazon machine model mode. Um, we also make them available uh, as a CloudFormation template. So a lot of our ISVs have actually taken the time to establish a CFT that say, you know what, you can buy it as a single instance, but typically people deploy this in a six instance cluster, so you can have that as available as well. Uh, Marketplace also allows you to deploy uh, SaaS-based products and announced uh, this week as well, package-based software. So if you want to have packages that are maybe just like an MSI file or a .rpm file, if you're maybe a Red Hat shop or .deb file, we have the ability to, to have those through the Marketplace. So in this case, I want to take a look at the customer rating. So we're going to click on this link here, and it pops up the customer rating. And so you can see here's, uh, you know, similar to the retail experience, if any of you have shopped on the retail side, the customer ratings are very powerful, right? Because these are independent write-ups of that technology. And so, you know, these are, are really good, and we, we find that a lot of customers really rely on these reviews because they're independent voices of that solution. And so you can see here, this is a pretty good review here for F5. You know, most amazing Swiss Army knife for networking in the middle. So um, that looks pretty good. So I'm going to go back to the main seller page now. And maybe I want to try this out. Well, you know, with, with this product, you can see that there's actually a free trial available through the marketplace. That's great. Well, let's see what kind of locations it's available in. So you can click this uh, for region pull-down menu. And this will show the regions that this product is now available in. And so these are all instantly able to be deployed to you uh, depending on your selection. So you can see a lot of North American locations, a lot of MIA locations, a lot of Asia-Pac locations. And so again, we kind of replicate this catalog across the globe, uh, really for customer ease of use. As you scroll down on the page, you can also see your pricing options. So this is further down the page, and you can see the pricing is available by instance type. Um, and you can see what the software cost is per hour, what the EC2 cost is per hour for your total labor cost, your total loaded cost there. And this is on the hourly model. If you click over to the annual, you can see um, if you switch the annual pricing, you automatically get a built-in discount. So if you're willing to commit to an annual subscription for this product, as you can see here with F5, they automatically have a 37% discount that they've loaded into the pricing. So it gives you lots of flexibility on how to pick that, right? So now what we're going to do is I'm going to transition this over to Varun Gupta. So Varun's going to join me. He's uh, from Salesforce, and he's going to talk a little bit about how they've established their networking environment uh, in the cloud. Varun? Thank you, Chris. Hi, everyone. I'm Varun, and I have one of the most interesting roles at Salesforce. I get to innovate so that the rest of the technology organization can innovate faster. I and my team have a mission to empower our developers to innovate faster by providing them production representative environments, environments that they can use to validate their code in a production setting before they release it to production so that they make can make sure it's always going to work in production the first time it's released and provide a much higher quality to our customers. Last year, we were here and we talked to you about how we created an automated platform so that a developer could use a single click to bring up a production representative environment. Let's look at some of the key tenets of that platform. First one, of course, being representation. Salesforce is a complex ecosystem. We had to make sure we were able to achieve that representation in the environment we were giving to our developers. Efficiency. At the scale at which we are operating today, we had to make sure that the platform was not just efficient in terms of performance, but also in terms of cost. And usability. Well, a lot of times, while this might mean a good UI, remember, we are dealing with developers. We had to give them interfaces to use as a person, but also give them some key interfaces for automation integration. So when we build this platform, 
developers were able to go ahead and provision these environments. So looking at what an environment really looked like. Uh, yeah. Salesforce, as I mentioned, is a complex ecosystem. We shared this with you last time. It has multiple applications. There's a platform layer. We have to represent data. There are a lot of components involved. And all this has to be tied together with complex networking. What did it take us to build such an environment? Well, here is the list of some components. Of course, we needed some compute resources. Machines on which these applications could be deployed. And we were able to get, get that easily from EC2. Instances on which we deployed custom AMIs. And then we needed some databases and storage for which we used EBS block store to attach to those instances and seed that with certain snapshots of seeded data that developers could pre-set up for their testing and validation when they brought up the environment. And then one of the key components of achieving this representation was custom request routing. We had to make sure we were able to present our users, the developers, exact same request routing setup that we had in production. And for that, we turned to AWS Marketplace to use one of the very popular load balancers that Chris mentioned to achieve some of these, uh, uh, to fulfill some of these needs. Uh, to be able to simulate a true production setup, to be, able to, to be able to provide our users with variable load configurations so that they could validate different user loads for their feature and be able to make certain conclusions for relative performance validations against our production setup. Without this, we wouldn't have been able to provide a true representative environment. So once we had the setup, let's see how an environment setup flow looked like. A user would make a request to our system. Our system would take that request, figure out what components were involved, would go ahead, provision those resources when we receive the request. So we, uh, in the simplest form, it would be a load balancer, certain app servers, and a database server. Once the environment was built, we would return it to the user, and the user could use it uh, for their validation. The simple flow, in an automated manner, provided some key benefits. First one being, as I've been repeating, representation, which was actually the key for the success of this platform. If we hadn't had a representative setup, then there was no meaning to use this platform to bring up environments. We also were able to get very good elastic scalability. Whenever call volume was high, when a lot of developers wanted environments, which, by the way, if you can guess, dealing with developers, was somewhere between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. at the time of night. <laughs> so our call volume is high. We are able to elastically scale our platform and provide our users with what they need without having to worry about setting up all these systems prehand. And then whenever call volume dropped, guess what time was that? 7 a.m. Morning time. Anybody seen developers in office morning time? I haven't. Rarely. If I make it to office at 7 a.m. So whenever call volume went down, we contracted that usage. And we didn't incur any cost on the resources we weren't using from the time when our call, call volume was higher. And that allowed us to have some very good optimum utilization of these resources. We only incurred cost when users were using these environments to do their work. Once they were done, they would terminate these environments, and uh, we would uh, stop incurring any cost on those. That has led to tremendous growth of the platform. We were here in 2016. We shared with you certain numbers. In 2014, we started with 10,000 VMRs per month on the platform. 2016, we were about half a million VMRs on the platform per month. That, today, in a year, has grown to 1 million plus VMRs 
per month. If nobody else, it definitely makes the Salesforce account team at AWS very happy. <laughs> okay. So let's look at some, uh, let's look at a busy day on the platform. On a busy day, we could be churning up 400 different environments, spawning these, terminating these, mostly through APIs. At an average of 10 machines per environment, that involved spawning and terminating 4,000 machines a day. Cumulatively, this comes to about 100,000 plus VMRs in a day. And I'm not even counting the EBS resources and the snapshots and all the other resources that we are using. Even with the scale, given these are ephemeral environments used for an average of 33 hours, we had to be fast. We had to be performant. We had to make sure that we were delivering these environments within 15 minutes when the developer requested. Otherwise, it's an idle time for the developers. So we started looking for improvement opportunities to make sure we are always in those SLAs. We realized that we have certain lengthy startup configurations. We were doing some setup on every call that we got to get an environment for every resource, which could be done pre-hand, uh, and, uh, and the, we could provide that resource directly to the uh, environment request uh, with the preset of done. And we also realized that we were meeting our resource provisioning SLA in terms of how long it took to provision a resource 97% of the time. While given our scale, that's a very big, that's a good big number. However, imagine a day, two days before a major release sign of deadline across our technology organization. Everybody is trying to spawn an environment, and the calls are failing. Every single call is failing. Why? Some of our resources started taking longer than our SLA timeout that we had set up. That day, we were not 97%. That day, we were 0%. We couldn't let that happen again. We had to make sure that the platform was reliable so that every developer, when they made a request, they would get an environment back. And that's when we introduced resource pooling. Resource pooling, to us, was as much about optimizing resource availability as it was about making sure that the platform was highly reliable. However, to get to resource pooling, we had to decide and figure out which resources are we going to pool. Showed you a list of different resources that we used to create an environment earlier. We also had to have an automated way to create and manage these resource pools. And we had to stay efficient. When resources in a pool were not being used, we had to be able to switch state for these resources so that they were inactive and we didn't, did not incur any cost on them. Looking at individual pool, there were certain considerations. We, need to make, we needed to make sure there was a logical grouping of these resources. For example, app servers and DB servers. We had to be able to make sure Every resource in a single pool, though, was identical. So we had, we had to make sure an app server pool only had app servers so that we could pick up any resource out of that and attach it to an environment request. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we needed a centralized way to manage these resources. Once resource pooling was set up, this is how an environment call would look like when we would when a request would come in, we would just pick a resource from this pool. This is a preset of resource. Uh, we are not uh, requesting the resource at the time which we get the request. We just pick the resource from the pool and attach it to the environment request, which also makes it a reliable 
setup because we know that the resources in the pool are actually working and have already been provisioned. Okay, so those are th those of you who thought I was done and wanted to get out. Well, as an engineer, I cannot let you go without talking about some tech. So let's quickly look into what was involved in setting up this resource pooling. As Chris mentioned, a lot of uh, AWS setup uh, is with a VPC. We also have a VPC setup. As many of you maybe, our VPC is divided into multiple subnets. Each subnet gets its own pool of resources. And then there is a centralized pooling service which is able to manage these pools across these subnets. The pooling service comprises of certain components and several layers. The interface that's exposed to, the, uh, to other components for interacting with the pooling service is the arbitrator component, which receives a request, figures out where and which pool is going to be able to serve this request, and uh, uh, passes that to the consumer. The consumer component takes the resources from the specific pools that are needed for, uh, for the request, and attaches it to the request. There could be multiple consumers at the same time. And the producer realizes that a pool has been depleted by an X number of resources, and producers start to go and fill the resources back into the pool. Sleeper is there to make sure that when resources are sitting idle in a pool, they are marked as inactive so that uh, we don't incur any cost. All that state is saved in the database layer in a DB. Diving into a logical view of a single pool, essentially a FIFO queue, first in, first out. The first resource added to the pool is also the one that is uh, likely already set up, uh, configured by the time it is getting consumed. Multiple consumers could come in and want a resource. Now imagine. I have a two-year-old. When a bunch of two-year-olds come and they're hungry, and you start putting one apple out at a time, you start seeing some very interesting race conditions towards that one apple. They're apples for everyone, but if you put them one out at a time, they would all want to go to that one. We wanted to avoid those kind of race conditions in our setup. For that, we used mutex where we log the resource per consumer, so no two consumers would go to the same resource. Once the consumer consumed the resource, we would release the mutex, and uh, uh, that avoided a lot of the multi-threaded race conditions. We use the same concept with producers. Each producer is responsible to fill a certain specific spot within the pool. So we log that position with the mutex with that producer, and avoided multiple producers trying to fill the same spot and overflowing the pool. Again, keeping the pool very efficient. With this setup in place, here's how an updated environment setup flow looked like. You get a request. The call goes uh, to the source pooling service. The pooling service figures out which pools to use to fulfill this request. It's, uh, and the environment is created from these pools. Uh, and send back to the user. This improved our platform tremendously. We started out with a goal to reduce spawn time. Well, guess what? We were able to reduce our spawn time by up to 20%. 20% at the scale at which we are operating 400 environments a day at a peak time is big numbers. And who do you think was the most happy person about reducing this time, reducing this idle time for developers? It was the managers. The managers were happy that the Scrum teams were spending less time waiting for environments and spending more time on validating their changes. But we had something for developers as well. We were able to increase the confidence 
that a resource would come up and be working in an environment by more than 99%. This was key. This increased the confidence of our users in the platform. This made sure that when they requested for an environment and they start using it, it would actually be working so that they could ensure a higher quality of their features, in turn, making our customers successful when that feature went into production. It impacted the overall quality of the product we deliver to our customers. At Salesforce, innovation is in our DNA. We have been recognized as the most innovative company in the world multiple years in a row. And if one thing you could take back from this conversation today, that would, from my side would be, it takes innovation to fuel innovation. You might be using latest technologies, latest features, but there, might, there will still be scope to make things better in the context at which you are using those systems. I would advise you should go back, look at what you're using and how you can make it better for your users and, in turn, make your customers successful. Good luck to you all. Thank you.